Okay, we're back with another example. And so in this example, I've already drawn in two constraints, orange constraint, G2, pink constraint, G1 constraint. The feasible set is on this side of each constraint. That is, this is the less than or equal side of each constraint. And that means the gradients point in these directions. So these are the directions of increase of the G1 function and the G2 function. And I have drawn in as well the level curve of our objective function that passes through the point x hat. So let's see what's happening here. Let's see if this is a solution to our maximization problem, and let's see if the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are satisfied. So uh, we can see right off that this does not appear to be a maximizer of our objective function subject to uh, our constraints. That is, this is not the best value of f in the feasible set because all of the vectors in this lens-shaped region are vectors that are on a higher objective contour than the level curve through x hat. So all of the things in this lens-shaped region give a larger value of f. So let me say this is something that we actually refer to as the lens, and it's a region in which all the x's are bigger than, or give a value of f, larger than the value of f at x hat, and they're all feasible. So everything in here is in the feasible set. So I have vectors in this lens shape region, they're in the feasible set, give a larger value of f, so x hat is not a solution of our uh, is not a solution of our maximization problem subject to these two constraints. Now let's check the Kuhn-Tucker conditions. Clearly, all the concavity and convexity requirements are satisfied, so it had better be the case if our Kuhn-Tucker conditions are sufficient to yield a solution, then it had better be the case that the Kuhn-Tucker conditions aren't satisfied, because if the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are satisfied and they're a sufficient condition, then star would have to be true, and it's not. So let's check out the Kuhn-Tucker conditions and see if they're satisfied. Well, the gradient of the objective function at x hat is, of course, orthogonal to the level curve, so it looks about like this, let's say. Here's the gradient of f. And so the gradient of f here, let's see, it's clearly a linear combination of the two constraint gradients because they're linearly independent. We're in R2. Every vector in R2 is a unique linear combination of these two vectors. But of course, the, this has to be a non-negative linear combination of these two vectors in order for the Kuhn-Tucker conditions to be satisfied. The, the Lambdas have got to be in R plus. The lambdas have to all be non-negative. So here we have the gradient of f is, I would say it is, uh, let's go out to about here. I would say it's about two, um, let's say two and a half times the gradient of G2 minus about one and a half the gradient of G1. So I've got minus 3 halves gradient G1 plus about, what did I say, 2 and a half, about 5 halves gradient G2. Uh, that looks about right. I've got to go out quite a ways out here and then pull back in the direction of negative gradient G1. And so that looks about right. So this is minus 3 halves. So I have lambda 2 positive, but I have lambda 1 negative. So the gradient of f is not 
a non-negative linear combination of the two constraint gradients. Remember, because we're in R2 and they're linearly independent, this is the, this is the unique linear combination that gives me gradient F. Um, so it's not a non-negative linear combination. Furthermore, it's not in the cone-shaped regions, not in the cone formed by the two uh, constraint gradients, which is the same thing geometrically as saying it's not a non-negative linear combination of the two, of the two gradients. So uh, immediately we can see that the, the first of our sets of conditions is violated. We have to have lambdas that are non-negative giving us the gradient F less than or equal to the uh, non-negative linear combination of these gradients. Or we can go down here to our uh, vector inequality uh, version of the uh, Kuhn-Tucker conditions. And again, we see that the gradient F is not less than uh, or equal in every component to a non-negative linear combination of the gradients of the G's. So immediately, we can see that the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are violated, are not satisfied, and that's just fine. That just tells us that since the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are necessary for x hat to be a, a solution, the fact that they're violated says that x, x hat can't be a solution. Conversely, um, the fact that x hat's not a solution and that these are alleged to be sufficient conditions then the Kuhn-Tucker conditions couldn't be satisfied if this is not a solution. So both, both of our theorems, in fact, let's put them back up here, both of our theorems where the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are a sufficient condition, Kuhn-Tucker conditions aren't satisfied. Kuhn-Tucker conditions are a necessary condition, Kuhn-Tucker conditions aren't satisfied. X hat's not a solution. So uh, I think that pretty much uh, does what we want to do for this example, so it's really a, a, a kind of a counterexample showing that we actually do need to have, uh, indeed, we need to have the gradient of F be a non-negative linear combination of the constraint gradients. Okay, so that's good for this example. Let's take this off and we'll come back in a moment with uh, yet another example. Okay, and we're back with another example now. And so let's see what's going on in, uh, in this example. So here I have, again, a pink constraint, the G1 constraint. I have an orange constraint, the G2 constraint. Here's my X hat, my candidate for being a solution of our maximization problem. And here, in kind of a iridescent yellow-green, I have the level curve of the objective function passing through that proposed solution. And so what can we say about this example? Let's first notice that the gradient of the objective function looks like this. And let's note that the gradient of the first constraint function points in exactly the same direction because there's a tangency between the level curve of F here and the constraint. And so let's say that is about uh, here. So let's say that's the gradient of the G1 uh, constraint function. And let's note that gradient F is actually equal to about two times the gradient of G1. And since it's a unique linear combination of the gradients of the two constraint functions, although I haven't actually drawn the gradient of this one yet, but it's going to be linearly independent of this one. And so uh, that means that I must have a zero as my scalar on 
the other constraint function. So let's see here. What I have is the orange constraint is actually not binding. So I need to draw the uh, level curve of the G2 function passing through x hat. So I'm going to write that as more of a kind of dotted curve. And the gradient of this G2 function at x hat is, of course, orthogonal to the level curve at x hat. So this is the gradient of the G2 constraint function at x hat. And indeed, it does turn out that the gradient of f is 2 times the gradient of G1 plus 0 times the gradient of G2. So 0 gradient G2. So lambda 2 is 0 in our non-negative linear combination. And lambda 1 is positive. So what do I have? I have that, and let's suppose that we're in the interior of the positive of the non-negative quadrant again. We're gonna we're gonna check that out in our next example. So we have, let's say, x1 and x2 positive. We have uh, we have lambda 1 positive, and we have g1 at x hat equals b1, because x hat is on the g1 constraint. g1 of x hat is equal to b1. That's good, because uh, the second set of inequalities here says that if lambda 1 is positive, then the G1 constraint inequality has to be an equation, and it is. We have lambda 2 is 0 in our non-negative linear combination, and G2 of x hat is less than B2. So here we have constraint. Let me just write this in a different color. Here we have our constraint is binding. And here we have our constraint is non-binding at the proposed solution. The binding constraint our lambda can be positive as it is. The non-binding constraint, it's got to be the case that the lambda is zero as it is. So this tells me that the second set of inequalities together with the extra condition uh, on uh, the uh, inequality being an equation, if we have a positive Lagrange multiplier, that's okay and that's okay. So we've checked off those conditions. And now what about the first set of inequalities? Indeed, we have gradient of f is equal to a non-negative linear combination of the gradients of g1 and g2. So indeed, uh, the fact that, uh, that those are, are both uh, non, it's a non-negative linear combination and and it says that we have to have this equal in each component if the x's are positive. So, but that's okay because here we actually do have, we do have that uh, partial f with respect to x1 actually is equal to lambda 1 partial of g1 with respect to x1 plus partial of g2 with respect to x1. It's equal because the gradient equal in each component. So this is equal to lambda 1 partial g1 x2 respect to x2 plus lambda 2 partial g2 respect to x2. And both of them are actually equal because uh, we actually have our gradient 
equal to this non-negative linear combination, which means the left-hand side is equal in every component to the right-hand side, which is what this says down here, and that's consistent with the x's both being positive. So what do we have? It seems clear visually that x hat is a solution of our maximization problem. It gives us the largest value of f among all of the vectors in our feasible set. So we do have a solution. And the Kuhn-Tucker conditions are all satisfied. I should check off this one and this one as well. So we have Kuhn-Tucker conditions are satisfied. And the difference between this example and the previous examples, of, of course, is that here we were checking the Kuhn-Tucker conditions in a situation where we had at least one of the constraints non-binding. All the prior examples, the constraints were we're both binding. And so the constraints both being binding, um, we could have our lambdas positive. But here we have a non-binding constraint. The associated scalar, the associated Lagrange multiplier, has to be zero. So again, we can check the Kuhn-Tucker conditions, and they're satisfied. That's, a sufficient, uh, that's sufficient to guarantee that we have a solution, which indeed we do. We have a solution that implies that the Kuhn-Tucker conditions must be satisfied because they comprise a set of necessary conditions. So that's it for this example. Let's take this off and we'll do another example.